Uh, thanks so much to Sheldon and his colleagues for a great panel. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dean Ted Ruger of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, President Tom Sullivan of the University of Vermont, President Kem Gornley of Duquesne University, and President Julie Wallman of Widener University. It is wonderful to greet all of you to the National Constitution Center. You are distinguished educators, friends of the Constitution Center, and I'm so looking forward to our discussion about free speech on campus. Uh, many of you heard the end of that last panel where the faculty members had some uh, strong advice for you. Integrity, backbone, uh, physician heal thyself, more money. Uh, <laughs> and I want to uh, start the conversation by just summing that up by asking this basic question. Should private universities, and all of you are the heads of private universities, respect the First Amendment? Should they embrace First Amendment principles? In particular, should they embrace the Chicago principles, which advocated by the University of Chicago, uh, whose president, uh, Zimmer, has insisted that u private universities should respect the First Amendment. And essentially, the Chicago principles say that universities must protect speech that people find disagreeable or offensive, with narrow exceptions including speech that violates the Constitution or the laws, that defames particular individuals, that uh, unreasonably invades privacy. It may be restricted for time, place, and manner reasons, uh, or unreasonably interferes with university life, but otherwise, basically, the First Amendment should be protected. I ask this question in the context of a time when President Trump has said that he's about to issue an executive order requiring private universities to respect the First Amendment or lose their federal funding. And we just had a great podcast debate on this last week on We the People, check it out. Uh, there was a strong defense of the executive order by uh, uh, one advocate and a, a opposition to it by another, but the opponent noted that President Zimmer from the University of Chicago, although an advocate of the First Amendment applying to private universities, thought that this executive order was a bad idea because it would create a federal bureaucracy that would require universities, uh, would require the government to decide what counted as hate speech. So if you'd like to embrace or oppose the executive order in the course of your answer, you can, but broadly I'm asking you, and we'll start with Dean Ruger, should the University of Pennsylvania Law School voluntarily embrace the Chicago principles and essentially follow the First mm -hmm. Amendment? Well, I think to that uh, question, my answer is, a, is an unqualified yes. Um, I've read the Chicago principles. Um, I've had them sent to me many times in the past year. Um, and it's, um, it, it reflects our fundamental commitment to broad free speech for faculty and students, um, which sometimes can be quite cacophonous because when you allow uh, all members of the faculty and all members of the student body to speak out, um, you get a lot of speech, um, and that's as it should be. Um, but uh, it's, um, you know, I think so. The, 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 the certainly the spirit, and in my reading, the letter of the Chicago principles correlate with with what we're trying to do at Penn Law. Wonderful, President Sullivan. So eager for your thoughts. You're also writing a book about free speech on campus, and have thought a lot about this. Uh, should the University of Vermont adopt the Chicago Principles? Well, first of all, a, a correction, the University of Vermont is a public institution. Ah. Oh, okay. Although you wouldn't know it from my public funding. <laughs> uh, Sounds like the National Constitution uh, Center. Only 3% uh, <laughs> of my operating budget, yeah. so we, we say we're centrally located in the state. Uh, well, but, this, but, this is helpful, so you had to respect the First Amendment, and, and yeah, what was yes. that like, and do you think the private university should have to do so too? Well, uh, I have been in both public and private institutions, and I think while we should be very clear that private institutions are not bound by the First Amendment, I think the first panelist made that point, the academic norms, um, I, I think, of private institutions certainly try to follow as closely as possible as they can. At a public institution, uh, our own First Amendment statement is very close to the Chicago principles. Um, uh, I wrote that statement, and, and I did it not following Chicago, but rather following what I saw was, I thought, the clear jurisprudence of the United States Supreme Court and the trend line from f the founding fathers to the present and, and how clearly and directly the present Supreme Court has uh, uh, expanded 
with several exceptions, four exceptions, expanded the almost absoluteness of the First Amendment to public institutions. You mentioned those four exceptions in your writings. Tell the audience what they are. Yes, defamation is an exception not protected by the First Amendment. Obscenity, similarly not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, the clear and present danger test, which we may get to now, known as the direct threat test. Uh, and uh, conduct involved in, in, in a criminal conduct. Those are the four exceptions. If you don't fall under the four exceptions, I believe the present United States Supreme Court will almost always find that it is protected under the First Amendment, even if it's obnoxious, offensive. Uh, it's a very direct, linear path from the Supreme Court to the present time, in my view. And clear, thank you for that clear statement of the law, for that accurate reminder that the current Supreme Court has been nearly unanimous in insisting that public institutions obey the First Amendment, and also for your interesting uh, efforts to apply those principles uh, at private universities as well. Ken, we got two for two on the Chicago <laughs> principles. Where, where well, are you? Jeff, I like to think of them as the Duquesne principles. <laughs> of so we, we've been following <laughs> that precept for 140 years, really. <laughs> uh, but it's what we as educators do. And so, of course, free speech, it's essential to what we do as educational institutions. I will say, even though we're a private institution, not to get too geeky on folks here. There are state, con here. <laughs> state constitutions, and some of them, including Pennsylvania's and California's, may uh, protect free speech on private property. The Muhlenberg College case is one case under the Pennsylvania Constitution. So I would not assume there are no constitutional protections. I, I said you can't couldn't get too geeky and you can't. What does the Pennsylvania Constitution's free speech provision say and what does the Muhlenberg case say about that? Well, it, it, it had to do with uh, protesters handing out leaflets to protest, uh, I, I believe it was the director of the CIA at, time, at that time, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court at that time, now there have been a bunch of cases since then, said that essentially the school had opened itself up as a public forum and so therefore, the public was invited and people had a right to engage in free speech. And in California, there's a, a private right to free speech under the state constitution. So again, I just want to remind people that there are actually, there's another set of protections on top of the US Constitution. But let me just end by saying in terms of the proposal by the current administration, these ideas aren't new. As you know, there have been legislative proposals in Pennsylvania dating back 15, 20 years. Uh, just as there's now legislation pending in Kentucky and Idaho, I believe it is. And I understand the frustration that leads to these efforts. I don't see how they work. First of all, they're likely to get struck down like many of these speech codes were in the early 90s, the late 80s. They're usually vague, overbroad, chilling of speech. But more importantly, it relates to something the last panel was talking about. Who's monitoring this thing? Who gets to decide, no, this university isn't complying? We, we believe very strongly in protecting free speech on our college campus. But who's going to come in and make that decision? That will swing back and forth depending on which administration is there and which speech they like or don't like. So I don't see how it works, frankly. Uh, I, I think educators are the best ones to do that. I do think you can incentivize robust encouragement of free speech by perhaps providing some you know, in, in, incentivized grants and things like that to do a lot of this good stuff. But I think ultimately the educational institutions are the best protectors. Thank you for all of that helpful information, both the pending laws in several states, as well as states like California, which have already applied the First Amendment to private universities, and also for your concerns about who decides and your statement that universities should decide, I should say, Thank you also for the superb conference that Duquesne, with, in collaboration with the National Constitution Center, sponsored on the First Amendment in the fall. That was one of the best free speech events we've done, and this conversation is part of our ongoing well, I thought it was the best. It yeah. was, <laughs> ab absolutely, until, the, until, tonight. until, this, until, until tonight. tonight, absolutely. Another one of the best collaborations we've done is with Widener University, and the visionary Julie Wallman has started this wonderful and common ground initiative, which brings together students of different perspectives, economic and otherwise, to confront views that they may not agree with and debate them respectfully. And I'm so uh, honored to be your partner with that. Um, 
I'll ask you whether you think Widener should respect the Chicago principles and just for the sake of debate, which we exist to promote, if, if, what's the argument against adopting the Chicago principles if you don't think they should be adopted? Well, it's hard to make that argument because I, I don't believe it. Um, I think, um, as my colleagues have said, um, education is about encountering perspectives that are different. That's what we do. If all we did was when students, whether undergraduates or graduates, came to us was reinforce what they already knew and already believed, they wouldn't be learning. They wouldn't be transforming their understanding. So we want them to encounter perspectives that are different from theirs, that challenge their beliefs, that make them uncomfortable, not physically, but um, you know, in, cognitively and emotionally in some cases, um, so that they can begin to try to understand. And our Common Ground um, program is really focused on how do I listen and try to understand somebody else's perspective rather than shutting it down or saying that's wrong. Um, and that's very, very difficult. That's the work of, of education. Um, so I think there's, it's hard to make an argument against free speech. The, the notion that free speech um, isn't required on private campuses, I think is almost irrelevant in that we're all about speech, learning, listening, taking in different perspectives. That's what good education is. I don't see how you do it without that. Now, there will be people who will argue, I think, that there might be places on campus um, where, for example, in a biology classroom, may I come in as a student and take over the class by um, promoting my own perspective on something that's completely unrelated to the topic. That may not be the place um, for free speech, but there has to be a place for that. Um, there has to be a venue and there have to be opportunities for people to listen to um, that which they do not agree with. Thank you for that. Well, I think this is a very significant and interesting first round of questions. You have four distinguished university leaders from different perspectives, all embracing the Chicago principles, which is not a position I think that the majority of private universities take. At the same time, all of you, as all university leaders do, have been involved in controversies about the proper balance over free speech, and this is the time to turn to that, uh, to, to those controversies. Uh, Dean Ruger, on the last panel, Professor Wax uh, made some strong statements <laughs> about uh, uh, the First Amendment at Penn Law, and I'm just reading from my legible notes. Uh, uh, she said that uh, you took away her first year uh, classes because students felt uncomfortable uh, and they said, we're gonna make the classroom into a fact-free zone. And she suggested that you were taking feelings account over uh, facts and the First Amendment. So of course, a response would be welcome. Yeah. Well, you know, I showed up just five minutes before this panel, um, so, but thank you for... Uh, um, <laughs> no, uh, welcome yeah. to the Constitution. No, look, I think, I mean, uh, uh, Professor Wax is a, is a brilliant scholar and uh, continues to exercise uh, her um, trenchant voice uh, and speak out uh, on campus uh, in halls like this uh, around the country and the world. And that's exactly as it should be, even when she's criticizing me and the Penn Law School and, and the University of Pennsylvania. That's one thing that our academic commitment to free speech means is that universities are quite unique places where we um, support and pay and, and make kind of stable situations even for those who disagree most with us and those who speak out uh, most intelligently against us. Um, and uh, that's very airtight. Um, at law school, well, it, it, throughout the university, but particularly at professional schools, we're actually trying to two, do two very important things at once. One is, at law schools, provide probably as large a range of discourse and speech across the widest range of political spectrum, much more so than not just any corporation or 
more so than you see on the floor of our legislative institutions, but a broader range of views than I see at any leading media institution these days are reflected on Penn Law's faculty and in our student body, and we want to cherish and preserve all that speech. At the same time, we are a professional school operating in a very competitive, shifting, um, somewhat perilous uh, atmosphere where law jobs can be scarce, where law applicants can be scarce, and our role is in our required curriculum to do the best we can um, producing the conditions of learning uh, to serve that educational mission alongside our free speech mission. Um, most professors at Penn, including me, before I became dean, and presumably if I, as soon as I'm not dean, uh, teach classes outside the, the fall of the first year, elective classes, uh, which is a, kind of a form of academic freedom where students get to choose the professors from which they learn. We have a, uh, an unusual in academia system early in the first year where we assign uh, people to classes with no uh, ability to opt in or out, and on several occasions over the last few years, um, over only one of which you heard about, um, I, like my predecessor, had made decanal decisions that our educational function would be better furthered by making a shift in the, the teaching assignments. Um, I don't want to say too much more specifically um, on the, the issue uh, that arose last year, except I guess I do want to emphasize the point that we want to have the broadest range of free speech, and all of our faculty, including those of us speaking here tonight, are continuing to exercise that free speech uh, very securely. But we're also performing this very important professional education function, and we have to do both to be a great law school. I just need to ask one follow-up. Was the decision uh, to uh, ask Professor Wax not to teach first-year classes consistent with the Chicago principles? Well, this is where, like any, you know, I just came from teaching a constitutional law class where we're all looking at the same text and agreeing with it. I think it is, although I understand and respect that, you know, various people um, on our faculty, in the community, and in the alumni base would interpret them differently. But I think, um, I don't think the text of the Chicago principles solves the hard questions any more than the text of the Constitution heart solves the hardest things that you study in this um, institution. Uh, there, that sounds like there's a strong argument on that score, and the Chicago principles do say that universities can restrict speech to ensure that it does not disrupt the ordinary activities of the university. Is that the text that might Well, I, didn't, I don't want to make a legalistic, you know, I, at the time that this decision was made, uh, the, the, the Chicago, you know, we hadn't, I didn't make a legalistic decision based on that text, but that's an example of the way that um, even the Chicago principles, which are held as a, the kind of beacon of maximal free speech protection, um, embraces the notion that universities have other functions as well. Well, this important debate, and thank you for engaging it, suggests that, as you just said, even the Chicago principles have room for debate. Therefore, President Sullivan, are they restrictive enough? You too. Uh, we're part of a free speech uh, drama at the University of Vermont. You were criticized for not uh, actively enough uh, defending uh, diversity and the concerns of minority students. Uh, tell us about what those criticisms were and what your response was and how it informed your decision to write a book about free speech. And since you know Ted raises the point, are the Chicago principles not restrictive enough and should the universities actually embrace the First Amendment standards themselves, which say that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, and short of that, should be protected. You conflated two very different pieces. So first of all, uh, we had the very peaceful uh, rallies and demonstrations on campus. We fully defended the First Amendment rights of every one of the people involved. Um, we had issues of how to promote greater uh, racial um, understanding on campus. Those are two very separate things. So the rights were fully protected. There were no arrests. There were no carrying out. Everything was protected under the First Amendment. We had a robust debate along those constitutional lines. And yet, <clears throat> and, you, and you decided uh, voluntarily to step down. Was there any 
connect, did you feel that the criticisms were fair? Was there any connection between the decision to step down and the criticisms? And essentially, did you feel silenced uh, by the protests uh, uh, in ways that might violate the spirit, if not the letter of the First Amendment? Well, the answer to both questions is no. I, I had an agreement with the Board of Trustees when I was hired in 2012 that I would serve seven years. I told the board that when we finished our capital campaign, I would announce shortly thereafter. Um, that's exactly what happened. Uh, two days after we announced, we completed our commitments to the campaign, I announced so that the board could have a one-year um, national search. So the two were completely disconnected. Well, then what, in, you know, in the spirit of my uh, exchange with, with, with Ted, what did you take from this experience? It, no, no doubt it's a, a challenging situation. It, you, you're, you've decided to write a book on free speech. What did the experience uh, convince you about uh, the balance of free speech on campus? What are you going to say? Well, the word you just used is a very important one, balance. It's not a term, by the way, that the United States Supreme Court uses when it interprets. But we on college campuses have to look at those competing interests. On the one hand, uh, the First Amendment, the robustness of the importance of speech, but also knowing where the line drawing should be between uh, my colleague mentioned it a moment ago, where there are interruptions or civil disobedience or civil discourse in a way that crosses the legality of the conduct. Those are situational decisions. They happen on the second spur of the moment. Uh, but on the one hand, we as administrators have to be, have a fidelity to the, to the First Amendment principles, but know, know where that line is appropriately drawn between when you cross from First Amendment protection into illegality or conduct that violates uh, the civil laws or the criminal laws. That's situational. It's very hard and dangerous to generalize unless you're in the tank uh, at the time. Great. And I think we should be careful, all of us, whether we're writing or speaking or teaching or opining to criticize folks on the ground making the decisions. We've had lots of examples of campuses across the country uh, where controversial speakers have been brought to campus, whether it's Berkeley, whether it's Charlottesville, whatever it is. Those decisions of administrators are very tough on the ground. We, we know in principle and theory where the line should be, but when you're calling the shots right there, you have to make judgment calls. Um, and we have now, unfortunately, a lot of examples in the United States in the last two or three years, particularly on college campuses. I guess, Mark, they go back to the 60s at Berkeley. Um, where those lines become clearer for decision makers, um, and um, ho hopefully um, the application of First Amendment principles to administrators is becoming clearer. Not all of us as presidents are lawyers. I happen to be a lawyer, so maybe it's a little more sensitive in terms of the line drawing, quite frankly, and the sensitivity to the protection of the First Amendment, but also know when there's being interference with classrooms or interference with work stations because of loudness, um, you, you should also know that the Supreme Court is very clear that we in higher education may set time, place, manner, reasonable regulations for the regulation of the application of the First Amendment. So it's not absolute, the principles, as long as the time, place, manner, restrictions, and policies are reasonable under the circumstances, universities may draw those lines. And that will be ultimately the test. What you did under the circumstances, was it reasonable? Uh, was it important to protect the security and the safety of the people, not just in the room where the controversial speaker may be, but we as administrators have the responsibility to ensure, and this is the primary, and it even trumps the First Amendment in First Amendment law, to ensure the safety and the security of all people on the campus when you have a controversial We've had a number of cases with controversial speakers, not on my campus, but elsewhere. Thank you very much for that nuanced and thoughtful answer. You've reminded us, first of all, that there are a series of competing free speech rights on campus, that of faculty and academic freedom, that of 
uh, students and that of outside speakers, and you've talked about the range of complicated factors that decision makers have to balance under existing case law in order to make those decisions, and you've also called for some degree of uh, trust in the decision makers to make the decisions thoughtfully. Ken, uh, what is the toughest First Amendment decision you have faced at Duquesne? Uh, <coughs> how did you make it? And do you think that trusting the presidents is a feasible claim in an age of pervasive mistrust of institutions when students and everyone else are demanding transparency, when no one gets any deference for their decisions, and when the kind of complicated, nuanced decisions that uh, President Sullivan is talking about are ones that everyone wants to second guess? Uh, I'll, I'll give you two. The second one will be short, but uh, Jeff mentioned this national conference on the First Amendment that we had uh, in October, and Jeff was one of our moderators as well. Uh, <clears throat> the whole goal of that was to bring in views from all over the political spectrum, Democrat, Republican, independent, anything you can imagine to show that the First Amendment is actually, I truly believe, the foundation of all of our freedoms in the Constitution. And it's actually one of the few things that all citizens can unite themselves behind at a time when we desperately need things to unite behind. That was the premise of this program. And so as we were planning, we had the editors of the New York Times and the Washington Post. We had Hugh Hewitt. We had the Solicitor General of the United States, Nadine Strawson. We had videos from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Governor Kasich. It, it was a dream group of people. And along the way, uh, a fellow named James O'Keefe approached us about participating. Those of you who don't know, James O'Keefe is in charge of Project Veritas which prides itself in guerrilla journalism, as it describes itself. So, you know, kind of catch people, sometimes posing as different people, and have video cameras hidden, and it's designed to usually embarrass people. They tend to be Democrats or Democrat-associated people who are ensnared. There was a lot of pushback when we decided, along with the Pittsburgh Foundation, to invite him. As uh, one, one fellow at the Pittsburgh Foundation said, what's a good First Amendment conference without some controversy? You know? But uh, we had a lot of pushback, including from our students. And the editor of the Duquesne Duke, our student newspaper, wrote a <clears throat> blistering editorial saying this was a mistake. We never should have included him in that conference. And uh, you know, it was, and, and a lot of people were talking about maybe not showing up as panelists or whatever. But but we decided this was the right thing to do. If you really mean what you're saying about this, you have to listen to views you don't necessarily agree with. And so I called the editor in, and we sat down and chatted about it. I had been a journalist a lot of my life and on the student newspaper. And I said, you know, what I really think you should do, I, it was a beautiful editorial. You did a great job. I think that you should uh, not, there was talk of protests if he came. I don't think you should disrupt or protest. Either don't come if you really are offended, or come and actually listen respectfully, and then write something else when you're done if you disagree with this fellow. Uh, and I told him, I had worked, I, I did a book on the whole Clinton star battles, and I said, you know, at the time it, when the Monica Lewinsky story came out in 1998, you know who, who, uh, who broke that story? A guy named Matt Drudge, using a thing called the internet. And people said, this isn't journalism, what's this internet thing, you know? <laughs> and I said, so it's always changing, it's always evolving, and people have for, for many, many, for forever been posing as different people in trying to write stories. I remember a very important book, some of you probably read it, called Black Like Me uh, in 1961 during the, the civil rights upheavals where a, a white guy actually <laughs> changed his pigmentation to go down south to write about what it was like to be treated. Well, that, that, was, a fr that was a fake to get the story. So I said to this young fellow, you know, think about these things and and try to, try to do what we really believe in at Duquesne. That's what they did. I was so proud of them. The thing went on. The world didn't end that we had James O'Keefe there. I was very proud of that. And the other quick story is that 
uh, you know, last year, the Westboro Baptist Church talked about coming and protesting. As most of you know, it's, it's known for its hateful speech. They've protested military funerals and just said awful things about poor dead service uh, members. And they were going to come to Carnegie Mellon University, Pitt, and then to Duquesne. We are a private institution, and we don't have to allow them on campus. And we wrote a letter to them saying that they were not invited on <coughs> campus, but the sidewalks down below our campus are fair game, and we knew students would go there. But we sat down with students and talked to them, and it happened to correspond with the Founders Week, where we celebrated the founding of Duquesne by these missionaries who were all about helping the underserved immigrants who came to Pittsburgh to work in the steel mills. And the students came up with the idea. They decided to simultaneously, there's no, you have a freedom not to listen if you don't want. They, they held uh, something on a different part of campus so people would not go down there and had a band, gave out free t-shirts, and it was called DU United, uh, Duquesne Doesn't Hate, or something like that, and they had t-shirts. And, and it was a wonderful thing, but the best part was that in the end, a thunderstorm came and it rained, and so they, the Westboro Baptist folks left, and the priest said, we prayed for that, that happened on us. <laughs> Thank you for those like excellent that. stories <laughs> and to the elements for, for blessing in that uh, protest. Julie, your toughest free speech uh, decision and how did you deal with it? You know, we're fortunate. We really haven't had an incident where um, we've had this kind of um, intense decision to be made. I would say that the most challenging um, decision was how to bring people together so that they're listening to each other. And we started this after the last election. Um, and there were students who certainly felt that um, they were, they felt harmed, they felt hurt by hearing other students um, excited and sort of gloating about the results of the, the presidential election. Others didn't like, um, and you know, we can't have this happening in our residence halls and what, you know, how can we be, you know, allowing this? And so we really thought, you know, we've got to bring these people together and start to think about listening to each other and talking to each other. And I think one of the riskiest things that I did was to start these common ground conversations where they're open to students, faculty, staff, anyone can come, you sign up. Um, <coughs> I don't know who's going to sign up. I don't know what topics are going to come up in these conversations. And it can get somewhat tense, but it's respectful. And uh, you know, I usually start the conversation by making myself vulnerable and sharing a, a, a story of and I, there's plenty of them, of course, of, of times when I've said something that maybe shut other people down or made assumptions or, um, you know, not been a good listener to other perspectives and get people talking. That's very risky because you don't know what's going to happen in those settings, but it's also really worked because people value the opportunity to have a place where they can bring their ideas and their questions. Because a lot of times it's professors who come and say, I want to open up conversation in my classroom. I don't know how to do it because we've got these, you know, I'm afraid it's going to explode <laughs> um, if students who have different perspectives um, start to, you know, have a conversation. So um, I think you've got to take risks and be open to listening to avoid some of these real um, serious clashes, which is not to say that you can't, that's, you know, it doesn't uh, ensure that they're not going to happen, but you're in a place then where people are, are used to respecting and listening. So when something does happen, you know, there's, a, there's an under, a better understanding, perhaps. Great. Okay, last round. The goal is to give the audience uh, a view from your unique perspective as the heads of these great institutions. Ted, unpopular speech by definition is unpopular, and traditional First Amendment principles are unpopular. A majority of young people, according to a recent Brookings poll, think the First Amendment does not and should not protect hate speech, and, a majority, and, and younger people are even more willing to turn to authoritarian alternatives to democracy and so forth. You've taught constitutional law as a distinguished scholar, now you are a distinguished 
dean. You've seen it from both sides. Is an individual dean able to defend First Amendment principles, or do you believe that some insulated body, like a court, is necessary to defend unpopular speech? Well, I think it's incumbent on us to try, and I think it's incumbent on us to go beyond a kind of, you know, the written word or the uh, empty maxim of the Chicago principles and actually look at um, who's speaking uh, and any kind of normative barriers to speaking out. Um, and we've tried to do that. One thing I, I completely agree that Professor Rax uh, has written is that it is harder for conservative students who don't have tenure to speak out than faculty with tenure or than liberal students. Um, we did a about two, three years ago, we did an opinion survey of our students on a number of metrics and student satisfaction, and we learned a lot. But some of the, one of the questions we asked was something along the lines of, I feel my voice is heard. I feel my voice is valued. And there were three statistically significant groups who came in lower than the rest, and that was uh, conservative students, black students, and women. Um, now, you might ask, you know, why did we spend thousands of dollars to see that an institution created over the past century by liberal white dudes uh, is a pretty good place to be a liberal white male. Um, but you know those three <coughs> groups, there's no question there are different structural reasons. Well, in two cases, for, for African American students and conservatives, they are a minority. And one thing that needs to be said is both on faculties and student bodies, conservatives in academia are more of a minority than they are, they're underrepresented relative to the general population. Um, what I, I think, have realized I needed to do better, uh, and I've done more in the past year, is work directly with our student leaders at, at, in law schools that usually inheres in the Federalist Society. Um, I'm really pleased. We have an amazing student leader named Lou Capozzi, uh, mostly due to him, but also due to some institutional support. We just topped uh, 100 dues-paying members in our Federalist Society out of just over 700 JD students. Um, a year or two ago, it was about 30. So that comes from his work, first and foremost, but also s something I've done with our other student groups, but I need to work harder with our conservatives, is supporting them with events and supporting their membership. And in a world where other top law schools are, have been floundering this semester with their federal societies, you know, our, our society is filling rooms, 300 people for Amy Coney Barrett, a couple Weeks ago, 300 people signed up to hear Jeb Bush uh, this Thursday. So it's, it's about, so there's a, there is a lot more we can do proactively rather than just kind of passively or loftily talking about free speech, institutional support and individual uh, decanal support makes a difference for any group whose voice is marginalized. Congratulations on that superb support of uh, the Federalist Society. That's wonderful to hear. And as you suggest, uh, giving support to underrepresented voices from all perspectives, minorities, women, conservatives, is crucial. And the simple enterprise of bringing all sides together to be heard is necessary, which is what we're trying to do here at the Constitution Center and why we're so glad that you're a part of this conversation. So thank you for those insights. Uh, President Sullivan, you, did, you talked very powerfully about the complexity of the decisions and then basically said, you know, if, if not, trust us, give, give us some uh, some room to make these tough decisions because someone's got to make them. But there is no trust today. So can an individual president be trusted to deal with the complexity of these factors and to balance them? Or are some other bodies necessary in this extraordinarily fraught climate on campus? Well, well I would edit your statement about there is no trust. I think there's a lot of trust on our campuses today. I think there are opinions that will challenge, and they should, as I said, under the First Amendment. But I, I don't like broad generalizations about there is no trust. There's a lot of goodwill, common ground on our campuses today. And what we as administrators have to do is, is create an environment that is conducive to robustness under the First Amendment, the concept that was used in the first panel, which I think is apt is the diversity viewpoint. This started with Justice Holmes and Justice Brandeis that started this conversation a long time ago. And we have a lot of uh, sharp, unpleasant, and p 
sometimes very positive conversations on campus. I'm talking generally here, not specifically. Um, and administrators need to be able to support the robustness of those, and at the same time, when they cross the line from hate speech, which the United States Supreme Court and federal courts have said is protected speech, whether we like that or not, I'm talking descriptively, not normatively. I may have other views myself, but the, the law is clear that hate speech is right now protected. And another problem, of course, is how you define hate speech. That has a different meaning for virtually everyone. I'm sure each person in our audience might share an opinion or definition of what they mean by hate speech. And that itself has constitutional challenges because the court would look at a term like hate speech or extremist uh, um, comments, which may be unpleasant or very offensive to some of us, and the court might say those terms are vague vague under the due process clause. And by that technical term, I mean, if, if, a, if a term is vague, I'm not quite sure what you mean by hate speech, what are examples. Um, a court might look at that and say, if it is so ambiguous what the term is, means today, hate speech versus a hate crime, that's where the line is, uh, then a court easily uh, under constitutional, long-standing constitutional principles may say overbroad or vague regulation, therefore unconstitutional application. You know this. Um, no, but thank you. This is crucial. Thank you for sharing. So, so, so we, again, need to be really careful on the terms we're using and what common definitions we may or may not have. But a, a court will look at that and say, if the term that brings in a regulation on free speech is vague or uh, overbroad, then it will be struck down under the First Amendment, meaning it's First Amendment protected. And it also may well violate the due process clause of the federal or state constitutions because a very important part of due process, the process that is due each citizen under the Constitution. And the two most important procedural due process concepts that we should all understand is notice when the government tries to interfere with my autonomy or my liberty, do I have adequate notice what the regulation or the charge is? And that do I have an opportunity to respond or defend? If a regulation or a statute is vague, the court will say it's unconstitutional and it'll also implicate due process because there wasn't adequate notice to tell the person that this was off grounds. So there's where we might connect the First Amendment with due process principles. And the bottom point here I would make is we need to be careful in a civil discourse that we understand the terms that are being used and that we don't try to self-impose our own normative judgments if we're trying to explain what the actual descriptive law is, or in this case, Supreme Court interpretation of the First Amendment. Thank you for those three extremely helpful points. First, for reminding us that there is trust on campus, and it's important not to generalize from the most extreme cases. Second, for speaking with such legalistic precision about the actual requirements of the First Amendment, and for trusting our audience to follow your careful distinctions, which I know you all did, uh, and all, as all citizens can, when you respect them enough to introduce the law, which is part of your final point, which is that the need to separate our political from our legal views and the faith that citizens can indeed, when presented with the legal tests, understand that the Constitution and laws must be obeyed even if they find the speech abhorrent. We're nearing the end of our time, so I'm going to ask for some brief closing thoughts. Uh, Ken and Julie, I was struck by the fact that, Ken, your example of reaching out to the students for the counter-protest um, echoed um, Ted's shoring up the Federalist Society. To what degree is leadership and actually engaging with the community an important part of defending First Amendment values on uh, campus? I, I think it's crucial, and I think you have to lead by example. I've always tried to, uh, when, when the law school had its 100th anniversary, our first speaker 
was then Attorney General Eric Holder, and our last speaker was Justice Antonin Scalia. And everyone was complaining on both directions, <laughs> but then they were all thrilled and, and thought they were wonderful presentations. I think that's important. I think with the new generations of students, I have a series on civil discourse, which is aimed at, we've talked about race and law enforcement, Muslims, immigration, and the American dream, the most difficult topics, but to teach students to do this with respect actually listening and understanding because they aren't getting this folks in their in faith communities anymore they aren't getting it in their communities anymore we have the obligation to backfill and shore that up and and i i just want to end jeff you know i i had the privilege of writing the biography of archibald cox great constitutional lawyer many of you in the audience actually know who he is which is great because a lot of my students don't but, <laughs> Remind those who don't. Who yeah, he it, well, he was the Watergate special prosecutor, but also a, the Solicitor General under John F. Kennedy, great constitutional lawyer. But he was acting in the role as de facto president of Harvard during the student riots of the late 60s and early 70s. And he, he faced a really difficult moment when there were counter protesters coming in, students protesting the South Vietnamese dignitary, and they viewed him as the enemy, and they were shouting and wouldn't let him talk. And Cox finally stood up, and he ends his speech with this little paragraph. I copied it this morning going out the door because it's so powerful. He said, and no one heard him. These people didn't even hear him, but it was printed all over the country. Freedom of speech is indivisible. You cannot deny it to one man and save it for others. Over and over again, the test of our dedication to liberty is our willingness to allow the expression of ideas we hate. If those ideas are lies, the remedy is more speech and more debate so that men will learn the truth. If we teach that to our students, our young men and women, we will be good here in the Constitution Center for another couple hundred years. <laughs> Julie, the words of Cox are tough to follow, but I know, <laughs> I, know, I know you can do it. The last word is to you. What is next for the Common Ground Initiative, and how will it and will you uh, teach people of those, that inspiring principle of the necessity of listening respectfully to the thoughts we hate? Right, so I think um, the way we do that is by bringing together people who have different perspectives and ensuring that we have them in the room as we have our common ground conversations, that we're bringing speakers to campus who bring different perspectives, and that we're preparing our students to be open to those perspectives. Um, because I think that you know, everyone's gut reaction and we get into our filter bubbles, our social media filter bubbles is, I don't have to listen to that, I don't like it, I don't wanna go hear that person, um, I don't agree with you, I'm gonna shut down my thinking about this. So, in every day, in every classroom, we're working on helping students to think about not just the topic, the content of the class, but also how do you open up your thinking and think critically, think analytically, seek understanding and respect other people who you're learning alongside, no matter how different they are from you. That lays the groundwork for everything that we're trying to accomplish in our country as we try to move forward in uh, respecting our Constitution and, and building a strong future. Beautifully said. For a robust, <laughs> wide open, and uninhibited debate, please join me in thanking our speakers.